Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at NCTM turning 100, maybe looking a little bit back, a little bit forward, and focusing on technology, learning, and teaching. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make those tough to teach tough to learn concepts, accessible to all my students. Tonight we're really lucky to be joined by our two panelists, Trina Wilkerson and Gail Burrell. Trina is a mathematics education professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the School of Education at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where she teaches both graduate and undergraduate math education courses and conducts professional development and research. She taught high school math for 18 years, and she's also the current NCTM president-elect, has been published in several of NCTM's journals. She loves teaching and learning math in support of current and future math teachers and leaders. Trina, it's great to have you with us tonight. It's great to be here, and welcome, everyone. I look forward to sharing some things about NCTM tonight. And Gail is currently a math specialist in the program for math education at Michigan State University and was a secondary math teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for over 28 years. She served as president of NCTM and of the International Association for Statistical Association. She received a presidential award for excellence in teaching math, the NCTM Lifetime Achievement Award, and the NCSM Ross Taylor Glenn Gilbert NCSM Service Award. Gail is chair of the AP Calculus Development Committee and a senior math advisor for Texas Instruments Education Technology. So Gail, it's great to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Mike, and looking forward to the conversation. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions that you have for Trina or Gail using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We're also using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the uh, WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. At this point, Trina is gonna discuss our agenda. So as you've already seen, we'll have, we've had welcome and introductions, and then I'm going to share about the past 100 years of NCTM, and then Gail's going to share some things about the evolution of graphing technology over the last half century, and then we're going to look at NCTM for the next 100 years. We're also going to be looking forward with mathematics technology, and most excitingly at the end, be sure you stick around for the webinar drawing, because there will be a drawing for someone to be able to attend the TQ conference that will be held in Dallas this spring. Thanks so much, Trina. And Gail is gonna discuss our expected outcomes. So tonight we're hoping that um, we can help us think about the key moments in mathematics education through the eyes of NCTM. Some of us were around for some of those key moments and some of you are probably um, just learning about them for the first time. Um, we're gonna identify some technology opportunities related to NCTM resources experience, I couldn't do this without experiencing some old and some new mathematical tasks, and think about the evolution of graphing technology in the teaching and learning of mathematics. Gail, thanks so much. Trina, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. All right, I'm sharing my screen now, and so one of the things that I would uh, invite you to do is to Come along with me to celebrate NCTM's 100th anniversary. Um, we would need to look at where NCTM has been and then eventually where NCTM is going as well. As part of that, keep in mind that in Chicago this year, April 1st to the 4th, we will be celebrating uh, our centennial theme and there will be all kinds of sessions related to looking at where NCTM has been, where it's going, um, 
through tasks that have worked over the years and ways that we need to go in the future with technology, for example. So we hope you can join us uh, and feel free to go online and take a look at the website related to that. One of the things I wanted us to do tonight is to think about how we reach teachers. So that is the membership of NCTM. It's the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And so in 1920, when NCTM started, it actually started um, as part of a group from the National Education Association. And it has its roots in Chicago, which is why we are starting uh, the centennial celebration there. But now the headquarters is in Reston, Virginia. One of the things that's always been the mission of NCTM is that it is to support teachers and advocate for high quality mathematics teaching and learning, but for each and every student. So in 1920, there were 127 math educators from 20 different states that organized for the first annual meeting. And then, and I believe it was 1921, they actually acquired the Mathematics Teacher Journal, which some of you may be familiar with. It actually existed before the 1920, but in 1921, that became the mechanism for which teachers were um, communicated with. Ideas were shared and they were able to share ideas as well. But what about today? Today is very different. We have over 8,000 people that attend annual meetings now. We have over 76,000 followers on Twitter, over 65,000 followers on Facebook, over 25,000 followers on LinkedIn, and one of the newest platforms in the last couple of years is the community support my NCTM. And if you are a member of NCTM, this might be something you want to explore because it allows members to form a community over areas either specific to NCTM in general or some specific area that they're interested in, like equity or um, technology, for example. And they can share ideas. If you're a new teacher, you can share out, you can ask questions, excuse me, you can ask questions, but you can also look at resources, et cetera. And we already have over 20,000 active members. So that might be something you want to check out. So how we connect with teachers is very different today than it was 100 years ago. And my guess is that it will be very different in the next 100 years. So one of the cool things about looking at the last 100 years is being able to look at a timeline. So NCTM staff began to do some investigation and they put together this great timeline. So sometime you might want to take a look at it. It's at nctm.org slash 100 timeline. And it's interactive. You can click on different pieces to find out not only what was happening at NCTM, but what was happening in mathematics education, and sometimes just what was happening in the world at that time. So, for example, I was curious um, about when I became a member of NCTM. So, you think about you. When did you become an NCTM member, if you are an NCTM member, or if you've ever been an NCTM member? For me, it was 1976. That's when I finished college and I started teaching uh, high school mathematics. And in 1976, I learned that that's when the Mathematic Education Trust Fund was established. And this is key because this is a funding source that teachers can apply to for a variety of different ways to support their own teaching and learning in mathematics and even to attend a conference. So you might want to check that out. It created all kinds of grants and awards, and it still continues today. Also in 1976, I thought it was neat to find out that that's when we started National Metric Week which was interesting because I think about the year or so before is when they passed the uh, metric act and we were supposed to all move to the metric system. That didn't exactly happen that way here in the US, but we still celebrate the National Metric Week. And then the last thing was NCSM, which was at that time the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, became an affiliate of NCTM and they wrote an, a position statement that really elevated problem solving to be one of the most important basic skills. So I thought those things were interesting, and I thought you might want to take a look at that timeline yourself and find out what was going on. So in relation to that, some things you might want to investigate. Well, Iris Carl was our first African-American president of NCTM. One of the neat things about her is during her time, it was in 1990 to 1992, and you may recall that in 1989 is when NCTM published the first set of curriculum standards. They were like the forerunner in that particular area. So as a result of that, when Iris Carl became president, she did a big push to gain new members in order to connect them around this curriculum. And the question is, is how many new members came in the two years of her tenure? So that might be something you might want to look up. Uh, you might even look in the chat box if you're interested. You might, want, you might post that answer there if you find that out. 
One of the others that I thought you might be interested in is, since this is a TI webinar, is TI-25 math. That was one of the first calculator-like devices that was sold. And the question is, when was that? And I found this really cool, so I'm going to give you the answer to this, because the year of it was interesting for me. It was actually in 1972. And in 1972 is when I graduated from high school. I did not own a data map, but it was really neat that that came out at that time. Another thing you might be interested in is when did NCTM elect its first female president? And the year might surprise you, because it was quite a long time ago. It was in 1926. And the question might be, you know, what was her name? Do you know who that was? You might want to look that up. And then the last one, given technology these days, is you might be interested to find out in what year did NCTM start using social media? And the date might surprise you. So it's an interesting thing as well. Okay, and at that time, it's when uh, I also looked up this. You can look up social media, but I thought it was really neat that when, uh, in 1995, NCTM started its first website. So interesting. So now one of the things that NCTM has done over the years is um, written position statements on particular kinds of issues, also written research briefs to give teachers and teacher educators and teacher leaders across uh, the U.S. and Canada ideas on synthesizing the research for around particular topics, one of which is actually technology. And this has been really important for a lot of people to think about why we need to use technology, what's the reason and the role for it. So that's one of the things. So one of the things I'd like for you to respond to in the chat box, if you would like to, is to think about well, what do you see as the role of technology in teaching and learning mathematics? So I'm going to give you a minute to do that. What do you see as the role in the teaching and learning of mathematics? I see that. It can be a great tool. Excellent. Oh, another excellent one, deepening the level of understanding. I think that's one of the powers of it. Analysis, excellent. Asking those what if questions. Yes, and the math through technology, y'all got some great responses. Validation, understanding, the variation in ways, representation. Oh, interesting. Decreasing the time to learn mathematics because there are things that you can do faster. Problem solving. Excellent. Excellent responses. Thank you so much and continue to add to it. That makes for a, a great dialogue to think about the uses of technology. So one of the things that I also would like to share with you is um, a statement from one of the position statements that we had that came out in July 2016. And it said that effective teachers optimize the potential of technology to develop students' understanding, to stimulate their interest, and increase their proficiency in mathematics. And when teachers use technology strategically, they can provide greater access to mathematics for all students. And many, many, many of the responses that you are inputting right now actually are the key words in this. The things about giving access, deepening understanding, um, being clear and strategic in how it's used. But there are a lot of decisions that teachers have to make in thinking about the use of technology. And I think teaching students to know what kind of decisions to make in using technology as well. So excellent. So here's another question to think about. So we'll change in our chat box to this. So what about the role of calculators in elementary grades? And I ask this because this has some differing opinions um, from different people. But when you think about what is the role of a calculator in elementary grades? So I'll give you a moment to respond in the chat box to that. There you go, they can correct. Having access to more realistic problem solving, they can use real numbers, real data. It's a little bit messier sometimes. <laughs> Very good. And there are some considerations. Some mentioned special needs, 
um, exploring. But there are some, uh, I don't know, maybe controversial kinds of things to think about. Um, you know, there are sometimes when teachers may use it for very limited purposes, or students use it for very limited purposes, and, and instead of enhancing problem solving, it may actually limit it. Okay. There you go. Some great feed. I uh, love the comments that y'all are making. It is a tool that's in to check for us, but it does raise questions about you know what kind of fundamentals. Um, it could, uh, that's a great one, it could inhibit number sense, you know, how do we keep it from doing that? How do we use it so that it develops number sense rather than inhibits it, okay? I can't tell you how many times I had students uh, share with me an answer that they that they got and I asked them, well, you know, how did they get it? What was their word? And they said, well, the calculator said it. And I go, well, we need to talk about that. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that I wanted to go on and share with you, thank you for those responses and certainly keep adding them, is in uh, 2015, one of the statements that NCTM published in their research brief, they did a synthesis of research. And with the idea of calculator use, is the NCTM learning of mathematics does not contribute to any negative outcomes for skill development or procedural proficiency, but instead enhances the understanding of mathematics concepts and student orientation toward mathematics. Because one of the arguments that some give is that it will take away from skill development uh, of students and procedural flu fluency. And actually, as this is saying, is that it will not have a negative outcome if it is used appropriately. And by the way, there's that data math, in case you wondered what it looked like. There's your full function calculator. Raised the question for me is, when was the first time you ever had access to a calculator? And when you first buy your own? Okay, I'll share with you my story. It actually wasn't until five that I actually owned a calculator, and it was a four-function calculator. Now, remember, I said I graduated in 1976 from college. So in 1975, in the fall of 75, I took a basic uh, freshman-level uh, accounting course because I just liked accounting. I was already a math major and doing all kinds of mathematics, but I just liked accounting. So I took this accounting class. And that is when I bought a four-function calculator. First time I'd ever used it. Before that, I used paper and pencil. Uh, I go a long way back, so I used those book of tables and logarithms to do a lot of the arithmetic that I had to do. Uh, many of you don't have that experience, I bet. And I love a TI-85 slide rule. There you go. I actually had a slide rule, but I never really learned to use one. I was sort of in that in-between time. That's great. What about your first graphing calculator? I remember it was in the 1990s for me. The TI-81 was the first one. I remember going to this workshop, and I was the math department chair uh, at that time in our department at the high school, and I just knew we needed to start using those graphing calculators, that they were going to be the thing that was going to push mathematics forward, and we were going to be doing an injustice to our students if we didn't get them, all right? And so I thought that was really important. I love that in 2000, um, there you go. You're right. Engineers did use slide rules. They used them a lot. That was how they managed to do all the calculations. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So just before I close out, one of the things I wanted to share with you is this idea of, of access and equity. And this is one of the real foci of NCTM. Remember I just mentioned that, I'm, that I thought when I was math department chair that we really needed to see how to get these graphing calculators in the hands of not only our teachers, but our students, because it was going to be something that would uh, propel them forward in their mathematical understanding. So it does raise the question, though, is what is really required to create, sustain, and support a culture of access and equity in the teaching of learning of mathematics? So you might want to comment on that in the, the chat box there. You know, what do we really need to create that kind of support and sustain that kind of culture to really have access and equity in the teaching and learning of mathematics? And for me, one of them was access to the right kind of technology. We have some others. What do we need to ensure this access and equity in the teaching and learning of mathematics? There you go, data-driven instruction. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, it is true. We need to know what our students know and what where they need more support. There you go. 
great software and others and demos. Oh, wonderful demos. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said Desmos, demos. Thank you. Excellent. So there, there needs to be uh, access. Uh, in a lot of different ways, not only to technology, but also other avenues and in, in visualizations, et cetera, of mathematics. So just to close out my part, and then I'm going to turn it over to Gail, is NCTM's position statement in 2019 had this statement, addressing equity and access includes both ensuring that all students attain mathematics proficiency and increasing the number of students from all racial, ethnic, linguistic, gender, and socioeconomic groups who attain the highest levels of mathematics achievement. So students need access, all students need access to really strong mathematics. So Gail, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, and she's gonna share with us some mathematics. And something about my voyage from, um, through technology. Um, so have we got this ball passed yet, Trina? I'm working on it right now. Okay. Any second now. All right. I think you made it. There you go. All right. So I'm going to actually, um, I thought I was going to. Um, get the right TNS file here so that you can guys can see it and start with my voyage. Sorry about that. Um, so my first encounters was an Olivetti calculating machine. This was back when I first started teaching many years ago. And this was the kind of machine that when it divided, it subtracted. And my students loved um, dividing by zero. It would subtract all lunch period and they couldn't really believe it. But they really did understand what dividing by zero meant. Some of you may have encountered the little professor, um, which was an early um, four function calculator that TI put out. And uh, my whole vision came to life when in 1990, um, when I ran the, into the TI-81. I had run into Burt Waits earlier in the late 1970s um, and 1980s, and he, he turned me on to all this graphing and graphers. And um, when I saw this, this calculator, I was awed. And then I'm still doing calculators and I went my way through the whole family. And now I, I swear by the TI Inspire and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think it's cool. Um, so you, you, um, I'm not sure if any of you actually remember this, um, the TI um, 81 when it, in its early ages. I am showing these things now in color on the most recent 84 CX, but um, there were some certain things that were like kind of cool and, and I was odd as a teacher and I had my kids solving equations, um, systems of equations by tracing. And then one of my students pointed out that there was a button that you could just push and then you got the ordered pair. And I was like, really? And they took time out to tell me that that was a little intersect button on my calculator. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I have to think about a different question to ask about solving systems of equations now that I got this little button on my calculator. And then those of you that taught calculus, you might have remembered the delight with which we finally found the hole. So we could actually see the hole. We were like totally excited because that hole was gonna show up there for us. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then I was into statistics from day one. And so here's kind of a cool question that I um, want you guys to think about. Um, and this guy, um, this was back in uh, 19, um, oh, I don't know, maybe um, 80 sometime. He wanted to get rid of the change in the United States. So he didn't say we should remark all the prices. We could keep the prices as they were. But every time you purchase something, you would generate a random number. Your cash register would be a random number generator and it would um, round the number up or down according to a certain algorithm. Um, and so the question that I have um, here is if we do this, who will profit the most, the customer or the store owner? So if you guys could put what you think, who will profit the most, the customer or the store owner? In the chat, that would be great. Um, 
And then if Trina or Mike would tell me what people are responding, that would be even better. This sound like a fair deal? Or obviously it never took hold, but would people, would the store owners have made more money? Um, would the customers have gone broke or would the customers have saved money? So far it looks like we have uh, I got a couple of votes here, sorry. Uh, Colleen said the store owner, Linda says the government, and I believe Scott said uh, $1 the store would profit more. Dorothy said it would work out about the same for both. So this is a fun question my students always really liked. And so um, do we, as a matter of fact, if you think about the soda can, 75%, would it cost you either a dollar or you'd get it free? That was kind of blew their minds, right? Of course, now you couldn't probably get a soda can for 75 cents either. But some interesting things, this is what we had to do back on the old um, TI-81. The random number generator gave you a string of decimals. So in order to make it function as a random integer, you had to take, multiply your random number by 100 and then take the integer part of that number. Um, and so that wasn't, couldn't happen to that one because those were random numbers. But so you had to turn all those things into random. So this is generating the random numbers of the cost, rounding it off, um, and, and then figuring out if I paid the $1, the $3, the $5. And here I can sum it all up and I can say, well, looks a little bit like my regular price would have cost me more. Um, I, looks like I got a deal, an $88 deal. Well, doing it once, the calculator let us do it lots and lots and lots of times, and we came up with an answer. It was kind of a fun problem to do. Um, so one of the things that happened in the history of NCTM is around 1999, um, they released this project, they got funded to do this, figure this project. And it was designed to give activities for middle school students and their families and their parents. And, and, um, and it's just consists of these interesting challenges. And so one of them is, suppose you found a roll of 15 cent stamps, and a, this was old, remember, and a combination of 33 cent stamps. Could you get together that amount to pay for a package that cost $1.77. So this is just a problem that kids can do, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to think about, well, what would the graphing or the calculator do for us? So these slider things are great. And so I can actually put this in my Inspire and look at in the notes page and use the math boxes. I can say, well, I want this to come out to be a 177. So I can play around with these numbers and see what would happen and um, it turned out to think about when this will actually come out to be 177, which is what it started out. Um, but I can ask my kids to think about, will the sum ever be even? When, how do you know? So the sliders in the math boxes will let me explore this question and push it a little bit beyond um, just the, the challenge that was in the figure this. Um, here's another one, how much is your money worth? Um, would you rather work seven days at $20 a day or be paid $2 for the first day and have your salary double? So this is an easy problem that kids can do, um, just both paper and pencil, and it's good for them to do that. Um, but it's also good for them to get some experience working with um, uh, spreadsheets and entering data and figuring out how to um, enter a constant so I can define something and, and say, uh, use a formula that will let me generate all 20s here. Um, and then I can find a cumulative sum for each of those things, and I can see what is going to happen in the seven days, and then I could actually continue the process and see what's going to happen as time goes on. Um, and so that would be just something, um, another way to add to the idea and get kids some experience in doing some nice problem solving. Here's a really kind of fun little game. Um, you roll two, each player rolls a die. Um, and if the difference is zero, one, or two, player A gets a point. If the difference is three, four, or five, player B gets a point. Do you guys think this is a fair game? What do you think? Say something in the chat. Fair game means you each have the equal chance to win the game. What do we think? Oh, we got a no. Oh, 
Colleen says, no, you guys are, are really thinking hard about this. Um, Dorothy says, no. And I could ask you guys to tell me why. Um, and you, the kids could work this out. So that's kind of a little question. Um, get introduce them to the notion of fair games, but I could also simulate it. Um, and I could run the simulation and you can kind of see that the orange is going to actually, it's not a fair game. And this is just after not very, very many simulations. Um, but just a fun thing to do. Okay, so, so I'm like into my Inspire. And I, over the years, I keep finding different ways and different things that I can do things. Um, using the technology to help build um, understanding and help kids figure out what's really going on. So I want to show you just a few things um, that help can help us um, position learning mathematics and statistics in a better way and how the technology today can help us do that. And so I want to show you um, here I'm investigating a normal distribution um, and it could be in a statistics course or or practically even in a pre-calculus course. And I'm looking at the effect of the standard deviation on sampling distribution. So this one that I have up here has a standard deviation. It's a mean of four and a standard deviation of five. This one has a standard a mean of four and a standard deviation of 0.2. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna add um, an X variable here. And I got a lot of variables in here. So I'm gonna add the S. Um, and now I can look at <clears throat> those two distributions and I can see what, what's the difference? What's the, what did the different standard deviation do? And I can um, generate more random, more samples that would continue to um, build these sampling distributions so that they can see what's going on. And I can go and I can change the standard deviation, um, have the kids make a conjecture, change the po 0.2 to 0.1 or change it to 0.8 and have them make a conjecture about what they think. So they would begin to understand the really important thing um, about sample size um, when these polls and things are coming up for the presidential um, election, they need to know something about sample size and how that might change the, the results of what's going on. So I want to show you a couple of other things. So one of the deals that is really important with um, AI Inspire is it can do these applets so the 83 and 84 are awesome calculators, but it, they have some apps, but not as cool apps as the ones that you can build for the Inspire. So this one is to help students understand the concept of variable and the concept of equation. And if you ask students what they think um, about what an equation is, you'll get some interesting um, answers, I'm pretty sure, because I used to always with my students. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm just dragging, I'm watching the output of the expression change as the value of the variable change. So a variable is a value that changes um, and gives you different outputs for different kinds of expressions. And so basically, if I go like this, now I could ask you a whole bunch of questions about what do you see, what do you notice? Um, and you might notice that as X increases, the expression is increasing. Is that interesting? Why or why not? Um, here's a really good thing. As X gets more negative, is Y increasing or decreasing? Is the output increasing or decreasing? Students have trouble ordering negative numbers, so it's a nice little example for them. But I can also click this button that says show equation. And now I put a big constraint on what I'm doing. I'm no longer just looking for the output. I'm looking for a particular output. I'm looking for an output that will give me exactly 28. So I'm looking for when I get something um, replacement and I found it. So when X is at eight, I can make this equation true. And that's what the process of solving an equation is. So an equation is just a statement about whether or not uh, and not uh, whether or not, just a statement and an expression um, connected to by an equal sign to another expression. And solving the equation is looking for um, the value of the variables that make that equation or those two expressions equal to each other. And we can actually talk about whether this is the only value that works, whether there's other values. 
Um, so it just allows kids to ground themselves into understanding what an equation is so that when they move through their mathematics, they have a better sense of what they're doing every time we ask them to solve equations. So you guys probably don't know, but I bet you wouldn't be surprised that the research suggests that if you ask kids to check their answers, the way they check their answer is by redoing the steps. Um, that's how they think what solving an equation it really is all about, is redoing the steps. So I want to show you a, um, another one of my very favorite, and some of you might have seen this before. Um, so I've got this urn, and I can click this urn, and it will fill with liquid. And so basically what I want to know is what shape urn should I have in order to make the corresponding graph of volume versus height be linear? Type your answer in the chat. What shape urn should I have in order for the graph of the volume versus the height to be linear? So make a conjecture and share it with us in the chat. Oh, somebody says a cylinder, cone shaped. Cylinder, right cylinder. Ooh, <laughs> that person is very right, okay? All right, so let's just look at this. Um, let me just take, okay, I can just actually take this little guy right here and I can drag him. I can take him, drag him in. Oops. I can take, I do this pretty more carefully here. But you guys are all watching me do this now. I can take this and bring him in. Well, I'm not letting go fast enough. All right. I don't know why he's bouncing around. Get that guy back in there. Well, he's a kind of a little shaky cylinder, but let's just see. Will the graph be straight? Ah, pretty straight. So somebody thought it might be a cone. So what do you think the graph is going to look like if it's in the shape of a cone? So you can make a conjecture while I'm dragging these things. I think it's my computer not letting this up. I'm going to drag this out, edit more, conical shaped, and let's get this stuff back down in here. All right, come on, let's go here. Pretty much the cone's got a dent in there, but that's all right. And as I fill this with water, So basically, you, this is a nice place to have a conversation with kids. This graph is going to turn out to be concave down. And why is that going to be? And what would happen if I inverted the cone? What's going to happen? And for those of you who teach calculus, um, what shape urn would have two points of inflection? So the urn is just a great little thing that shows you what you can do with this interactivity and an applet that's been designed to be played on the, um, the TI Inspire. And then there's this multiple graphing. Again, this is a calculus question. Um, but what am I going to do here? Which one is the parent function if I have the function, its first derivative, and its second derivative? And I can change it. So I have a blue one, a red one, and a black one. And asking which one is going to be what? And I'm pretty sure there are some of you in here that know who's the parent function. Those of you that teach calculus, who's the parent function? Anybody got a plan? I really like it 
when my students are able to say, oh, yeah, I know who the parent function is because the second derivative is, if the second derivative is the straight line, then the first derivative had to be a quadratic, and so this had to be the parent function. And I like that when my kids can do things like that. Um, and you can verify that. But one of the other things I really like about this is I can change the function however I want. Okay, so I can put whatever function I want to in there. And so lines are easy, okay? Trigonometric functions, exponential functions, I can just go up here and change this function to whatever I want to put in there. Um, I could change it from sine to cosine and say, okay, what do you guys think is going to happen? Make a conjecture. Let's see if you're right. And now what have I got? How has things changed? What's the same? What's different? So this whole kind of opportunity for conjecturing and making connections um, goes really much deeper and allows kids to explore and think about um, mathematics in ways that they really didn't um, before. Um, let me go um, back to my other PowerPoint here and just kind of finish up with a couple of things here. So first, um, Bob Moses was uh, somebody from the civil rights movement, um, and he, a mathematician, um, became convinced that we, he needed to do something about the teaching and learning of mathematics. And so he was the creator of this thing called the Algebra Project. And one of the things that he said was the, the role of writing calculators was crucial to moving his people, his students, um, into the mainstream world of mathematics. Because he, and he actually told me this in some conversation, that everybody else was going to have the technology. And so he needed to be sure that his students would have it too, so that they could reach the same levels that other people would have. Even if they didn't provide them in classrooms, the kids who had more means and more access would end up having them and his kids would be left out. So his curriculum was designed around the use of graphing calculators. Um, and he's had some very nice successes with working with um, students who um, ordinarily haven't had that kind of success in algebra and mathematics. And so my second to the last little point here. So 25 years ago, Dan Kennedy um, said from a teacher, a high school teacher, um, said, look around in the tree of mathematics today and you'll see some new kids playing in the branches. They're exploring parts of the tree that they haven't seen this action in centuries. You know how they got there? They used a ladder, graphing calculators. You might argue about whether they deserve to be there or whether they might fall. Maybe they don't know all of the things, pen, paper and pencil, but that won't change the fact that they are straddled along the best trunk climbers in the tree and most of them are glad to be there. So that's partly been my, my mission, my joy, and the, my, my road through the technology. And so just closing here before I turn it over to Tina. So tomorrow, Tina is gonna talk about tomorrow for NCTM. I'm just gonna say a minute about tomorrow for where we are. So this issue of equity is a big deal. Graphing calculators are a way to provide a platform for students who might not have a computer, um, who might not have access to the internet or to the web. Not all homes and not all areas of the country do. Um, so graphing calculators allow them, um, students, to have that kind of access. We need to open our eyes and accept um, computer algebra. We left up log tables. We no longer use that I part so that we can actually generate random numbers. Um, I think we have to think hard about what we do in algebra and make sure that it's something that's mathematically productive for our students to be engaged in. Um, and that they spend their time, like Bob Moses said, interpreting what's going on. Catalyzing change that Tina mentioned is very strong on the use of technology to support learning where kids spend their time interpreting what the, um, the technology gives you. I don't have a clue what the dynamic interactivity is gonna bring. I don't think we've thought hard enough about that yet. I think it has an awesome potential. Um, it lets us think about new kinds of ways of thinking about mathematics. And um, I think it's a really important um, thing for all of us to think about as we move forward. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen 
and turn the back to Trina. I can make this little ball move. All right, back to Trina. All right. So thank you, Gail. It's very exciting to see where technology has been and where it potentially can go in the next 100 years. So thinking, uh, continuing to think about NCTM and its role in the next 100 years, you know, what should NCTM do over the next 100 years? And one of the things that's happening now that you may or may not be aware of is that we actually have a new journal. Those of you who have been a member or are a member of NCTM may be familiar with the mathematics teacher, which was the first journal. Then we added teaching children mathematics to address elementary. And then a few years after that, we added the middle school journal. And now what we have is we've taken the pre-K through 12 perspective and we have one journal called Mathematics Teacher Learning and Teaching Pre-K through 12 and it just launched in January 2020. If you were a member of NCTM at that time, you got not only the print version of it, but the digital access. And that's one of the powers or the power of this particular journal. One is the idea that it's pre-K through 12. So you actually get some specific articles by grade level, but you also get some things that are across grade level. So we have a better understanding of mathematics and where it is, where it's going, where it will be at another grade level before or after. The other thing though is the very big power is the digital aspect. Now when people submit articles or when you read the journals, you will have interactive pieces, you'll have videos to watch, you'll have some of the writers actually talking with you or some of the students talking to you. Or you might have some interactive uh, technology much like what Gail shared with you that you actually can see it actually happening instead of just seeing it on a static page. So it's very powerful. Uh, and so we'll hope you'll get a chance to take a look at that and see what uh, it might do in the future. It's just beginning now. Also, one of the things I wanted to make you aware of that's happening now so we can think toward the future is in 2018, uh, NCTM published change. And Catalyzing Change was a document that, uh, a position actually for NCTM that had us think about where mathematics in high school needed to be. But in order to think about that, and if you have some ideas about where that's going to be, then you also have to think at early, think about early childhood and elementary and middle grade levels. And so now in 2020 at our centennial, we'll be releasing the other two volumes of the book. All four volumes are around these four key recommendations. Obviously, they have different nuances by grade band, but the four key areas have to do with really broadening the purposes of learning mathematics. Uh, seeing the joy, beauty, and wonder of mathematics, the power of mathematics in everything that we do. Structures, and you'll notice three is equitable mathematical instruction. So they're actually structures that are in um, our educational systems that actually might be inequitable and they really help, they really keep students from doing the kind of mathematics that they really need to do. And they don't have the access and they're actually structures in place that might inhibit that, and we need to do something about that. The third one is the equitable mathematics instruction, that there are practices to reach each and every student, and we need to ensure that in each and every classroom, and in each and every school, each and every school district, et cetera. And then the last one has to do with, well, what is the mathematics that really needs to be learned very deeply? Gail's already alluded to, there are things that, because of technology that have changed in what we need to know about mathematics. I mentioned earlier that I used logarithms just to do the arithmetic part of some of the calculations I had to do. Well, you no longer do that. A logarithm serves still a purpose, but not that purpose anymore. And so we really need to look at what we need to be teaching. What is the deep mathematical understanding that students need in order to be successful and to progress? And one of those actually revolves around the idea of technology. So when we look at technology, Catalyzing change in particular looks at these four aspects, and you can read them either the high school one already or the ones that are going to be coming out. But it brings uh, up the idea of let's just look at the idea of it can really be a driver of change in engaging students. As Gail's already shared with us, they actually, the students actually engage in the mathematical understanding and they're actively um, interacting with it. And so it brings a different level of student engagement. Another thing about technology that Catalyzing Change talks about is it really can be a catalyst for change and innovation. And we need to think about that because technology is ever changing. 
And it's not about exactly the technology itself, but us knowing how to use it effectively and where is it going to be in the next 20, 50, or 100 years. I think it also technology as Catalyzing Change brings out is that it changes how we teach and what we teach. Um, and that's one of the things that I know that we as teachers sometimes about how does it change the questions that we're asking? How does it change the tasks that we're presenting when students have access to particular types of technology? And then the last one is on us as teacher educators and teachers of mathematics as well, is we really have to carefully plan for its effective use. I mean, it's one thing just to have a calculator in your hand, but to embrace its power is another whole level of thinking and planning. So I want you to think about the power of technology. So let's consider. So, Trina, let me just interrupt one minute. So that's exactly what I what happened to me when my students found the intersect button for systems of equations on the 80 and the 81. I was like, well, no longer can I say solve this system of equations. Um, exactly. I need to think of another question that will get them to still think about what the solution means and how they know when the solution is there. But I have to be really careful about the framing of my question. It's true, and it just it puts a big responsibility on us as mathematics teachers to um, really learn to use and in, uh, the power of the technology and to think about the questions that we ask, as you said, in the task because it changes it. Um, you don't, you don't, you just need to ask a different question or a different way of doing it. So that's a perfect example. All right. Okay. So I want to consider something, and so I want you to think about this. You can look at it in your chat box as well to respond in just a minute, but uh, right now NCTM is also delving into audiobooks. That's not anything new, but it is new for NCTM, but they're actually starting to do that. So you'll see more and more books coming out in the audio version. But then where might apps go in the future or artificial intelligence? How might, me, how might we harness virtual reality? Where's it going to take us in the world of teaching and learning mathematics? And besides the teaching and learning of mathematics, what about building community? I started out by sharing where we were in 1920 with connecting math teachers and where we are today. Drastically different, dramatic changes. But what about in the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years? What will change? I mean, will we have virtual images of each other being able to, like, quote, stand in the Think about how to use that to build community and connect us as mathematics teachers. And then another one is supporting mathematics teachers. I think that's another important piece. How is technology going to help us do that? Uh, what kind of resources, exemplary resources in particular, do we need to have access to? Do students need to have access to? Some of you mentioned that in the technology itself. There are students who still don't have access to the kind of technology uh, that they need. And then another thing to consider is just what is the role of curriculum? Um, what is the mathematics we need to study? What's the role of technology? What's going to guide that? Who's going to guide that? And then the last one, uh, just that I thought about, is that we need to think about ways to support teaching and learning. We really need to think about that. Uh, how can we embrace technology to be able to do that? So in your text box, here's you a question, all right? I want us to take like a minute or two to think about this. What would you like to see NCTM do in the next 10 years? or 25 years, 50 years, or 100. I won't be around for those 50 and 100, probably not the 25, but where do you want to see NCTM in the next 10 to 100 years? So let's have some ideas. Gail, while they're thinking about that, what about you? Where do you That's think? just what I'm thinking about, Trina. <laughs> oh my okay, well, somebody actually asked me that, a question about would I rather um, go pa in the past for 25 years in a special moment in the past or go forward 25 years if I could have my choice? And what would I want to see in either of those? Well, I chose the, the future, and, and I, I was kind of like, um, thinking about a very different world of mathematical classrooms um, where people were doing really interesting different things with technology, where there weren't 
um, so much boundaries between um, classes, but more kind of um, conceptual ways of thinking about stuff. So I'm a kind of in the data science world where people are using the technology in, in bringing together math and, and biology and um, a little bit of programming or, or working with the data from those fields. It's, it's a very yeah, interesting it's question. Very exciting. And, and James, I love your idea about these, these research proven methods for teaching particular things and the complete lesson plan and support material. In other words, having that support. I uh, love the part about resources to engage uh, students and teachers uh, in real world, real time data. That's very powerful. Appreciate that. Um, um, and the continued support and tasks that are ready to implement in the classroom. And as you say, Colleen, and if they really align with what we want our students to know and be able to do. So those are some very powerful things. And I would invite you to be a part of that conversation. Uh, be a part of offering those kinds of things. Um, Katrina, can I jump in sure. one more time? Sure. Okay, so one of the things that I think is really good, and I'm hoping that NCTM will um, continue to lead the way in this, and that um, as teachers and educators that we would pay attention, is that we are now beginning to find interventions from the research that mm -hmm. are suggesting better ways to teach things. And I think that with NCTM's leadership, we can actually make sure that news about this research informs our broader community mm -hmm. so that people can say, okay, I might have been doing this for a long time, but maybe it wasn't the most effective way. Um, the literature says there's some other ways that I should be thinking about trying. Um, I'd really like to see that happening, um, and I know NCTM will be there in the forefront of that. I think that's very powerful, very powerful. So I invite you all to think about that and to come to the celebration in Chicago. Uh, visit the website and certainly email me. There's the email down there at nctm.org, T. Wilkerson. So just uh, email me. I would be delighted to hear from you if you have ideas or you want to volunteer to do something. Uh, oh, I love the virtual reality one. Thank you. Y'all are just offering wonderful ideas. All right, so Mike, I'm hoping we can capture all these. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to Mike. And so I have one question that sure. someone someone asked, and Mike answered it. I think I just want to make sure some of the um, the examples that I used are already um, on apps that are available on either the Math Inspired or the Building Concepts website, um, free from TI. You can just go there and, and Google it, and you'll find them. Um, some of the other ones are things that I created, and I think Mike will probably um, have access to them um, as part of what we do. I'll send you my files, if, um, and he'll post them someplace where you can have access to them. Thanks so much, uh, Gail and Trina. As we begin to wrap things up tonight, uh, I think at the very beginning, Trina had mentioned uh, that we have also a conference coming up, the T-Cubed International Conference in Dallas. And we're really excited that uh, we'll get to see some, some old friends again, but also uh, learn about new content and pedagogy um, and sharing of ideas. So uh, we hope you'll visit our website to learn a little more about the T-Cubed International Conference. And also, as Trina mentioned, uh, we're giving away to one person tonight a T-Cubed International Conference registration. And tonight's lucky winner is Teresa Osadnik. So Teresa, congratulations. Uh, we'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you a little more information about, about that. But we hope to see Teresa as, as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that were used tonight. As Gail just mentioned, uh, the, the TI Inspire file that she used tonight, uh, I'm going to add in to those documents link. So um, if you download the documents link right now, that's not going to be in there. Uh, but if you hold off, um, check your email in a couple of days, you're automatically going to get a follow-up email with links to the certificate, the documents, and the recording. And that documents link will have uh, Gail's file included. So feel free to download those uh, documents now. Uh, just know that, uh, again, Gail's piece uh, will not be located in that until uh, probably about two or three days from now. 
And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. So thanks so much, uh, Trina and Gail, for everything you shared tonight. That was really exciting. It was a lot of fun. Hope to see you all at the TQ conference in Dallas soon. And thanks to you guys for your good comments. You've got some nice comments for the vision of NCTM. Yes, and I'm hoping, Mike, we can capture those. I want to see all those more, so outstanding. No doubt. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night. Bye.